family this morning to Temple Baptist Church. We are so grateful that you're here today to worship the Lord, and that is indeed why we're here. And if you're glad you're here, would you say amen? And I thank you so much for being a part of our church, and what a wonderful weekend we've already had, a busy weekend uh, for the glory of God. We're looking forward to a wonderful day here as we worship Him. And I want you to encourage you to be a part of the service, to sing out, to pray along with us as we seek the Lord together. And we're looking forward to a wonderful day. I want you to pray for our children's ministries, the uh, children's church, the junior church, the nursery, the wiggle worms, and all of our volunteer staff over in the uh, educational wing, that God will bless them, give them a wonderful day today. And uh, let's seek the Lord together. Amen? And let's pray together and ask God for his blessings. We're going to hear from the choir once again this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of your day. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be a part of your church. Thank you, Lord, for this great church body. Thank you for this great church family, their spirit, their work. Lord, thank you for the many ministries that have already happened this weekend and yesterday specifically. And Lord, and your blessings upon it. Lord, I pray for your blessings this morning and also tonight as we meet together, Lord, to worship you. Lord, I pray that you would encourage, that you would equip us in the things of you, Lord, and your word. I pray that you'd strengthen us spiritually. I pray for your power, your blessings, your presence in a powerful way. We'll thank you for what you do. Meet the needs of our church family this morning. Lord, those who are sick, those who are watching online, unable to be with us, we ask that you would help them, be an encouragement to them. And we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. The choir's going to sing for us once again. I know you'll be blessed as you listen this morning. the building this morning and as we stand I want to encourage you to sing along with the choir as one mighty congregation this morning give it all you've got to worship the Lord he's worthy of our voice and our worship this morning let's sing unto him with all of our hearts this morning
amen, as you make your way back to your seat. We're going to sing third and fourth verses together. Words are on the screen. I want you to sing out if you will. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth. He is the leader. thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. We're going to sing this through a couple times this morning. I want you to worship with us today, if you will, and just think about how good God has been to us. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Thanks to the Lord, do we not? And He has been so good to me. Raise your hand uh, if you can think of at least one thing that God has done for you in your life. And I can think of many things He has done for me in my personal life. He saved me, you know, and that ought to be one thing. I thought I'd get at least two or three amens right there. And uh, God has saved me, and then, uh, and then God has just blessed me with a wonderful family. Say, Pastor, I don't have that privilege you have of having a good family. Well, I want you to just take a look around for just about two seconds. You got people in here that love you. 
And uh, we may, may not be blood kin, but we are, uh, if you're saved, you're a child of God. And we are a body of Christ together, and, uh, and we can be thankful and rejoice in that. And uh, God's been so good to our church, and I don't know if you noticed when you pulled in, uh, a lot of the trees are getting moved, our, what used to be our buffer. We appreciate uh, Houston Pinge and his team doing such a great job. Uh, out there doing that this week, and Lord willing, we'll finish them up. They've just been plucked out and put in and haven't been established yet, and uh, Lord willing, we'll get that in this week. And I'm so grateful to be able to be seen from Vianna, uh, Louisville, Vianna Road. Isn't that a blessing? And we're so grateful for that and grass coming up on the new property. And if you're visiting here with us for the very first time, uh, I want you to be patient with us as we are in a transitioning time. And uh, Lord willing, we will be building a new auditorium, hopefully about three years, and uh, we'll use this. If, if we run out of space before then, then that's fine. Uh, but about three years to continue to save and use our gymnasium here as our church auditorium. And then uh, when we uh, uh, build the auditorium out there on the corner, this will go back into a beautiful gymnasium. And we're excited about that day. And uh, you say, Pastor, what happens if we overfill it sooner than that? Well, that's that will be great, wouldn't it? And uh, we're ready now. We have the land. And God has so blessed us with that. And now it's time to receive our offering. So ushers, if you'll come if, at this time, if you will, please. As they're coming, let me remind you of just one or two things. If you're here for the very first time, I look around, I see first-time visitors all throughout the auditorium. And we're so grateful, as always, to have you visit with us here this morning. We trust the service will be a blessing to you. And if you, would, uh, if you have not received a gift visitor packet, we want to put one in your hand. We try to get that at the beginning of the service or before, but if you have perhaps not received a gift visitor packet, would you raise your hand just really quickly and so that we can get one to you? Okay, great. We hopefully got everybody this morning. If you'll be so kind to look inside that uh, packet, and you should see a large visitor card, and if you'd be so kind to fill that out for us and place that in the offering plate when it comes by, we'd love to have record of you being here with us this morning. Also, um, I want to remind you of our Easter services Coming up two weeks from today, uh, we have next Sunday will be the 24th, and then the next Sunday, April, March 31st, is Easter. It's coming a little early this year, and we're doing something for Easter that we've never done before. We're breaking off into two services, and raise your hand if you're thankful that God has brought us to the point where we, we have a need of doing that, and we're so grateful we're not doing that uh, for uh, just sake of just doing it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot a lot extra of work and, and preparation and so forth. We're doing that to, to uh, make more seats available. And so you can come at 8.30 or 11 o'clock. Uh, the uh, adult and children's Bible classes will remain the same at 10 a.m. And evening service will remain the same at 6 p.m. on that day. Uh, 8.30 service, uh, just one or two things different here. 8.30 service will still have message. Matter of fact, it will be the same message as the 11 o'clock service, so you won't miss anything there. The choir will not be singing, but we will have extra special Easter music, uh, special groups and uh, solos or whatnot. And, uh, and then uh, there will be, for the 8.30 service, there will be no wiggle worms and nursery and children's and junior church uh, over there. Now, the building will be unlocked, and we'll try to accommodate you if you need to get over there, but there will be no volunteer staff over there and will not make that available over there. But 11 o'clock, everything will be on the same schedule as always. And so 8.30 is just simply to help accommodate seats. And if you can be so kind and gracious, some of you, to help us with that, to alleviate some seats at 11 o'clock service for Easter and parking spaces as well. We, we, run, we, uh, we get close to that on some Sundays like today. And so that will really help with that as well. So uh, let's uh, be faithful to, to d d these things. Also, uh, giving this morning. A lot of folks give online. You can give online, Temple Baptist Church. Dot info securely, uh, or you can give in the plate. And uh, I want to encourage you to be faithful in your giving. It's how we keep our staff paid. It's how we keep the lights on. And it's how we make progress. Uh, we're not far away from paying off this new property. It was a large expense from buying homes and uh, not just vacant land. And we're so thankful God has made that available to us. And we want to get that paid off this year. It's one of our financial goals this year. Get that paid off so then we can begin saving for the new auditorium. And I want to encourage you to be a part of the building fund uh, and uh, also our tithe and offering. That's very important. And so let's be mindful of that this morning. All right, let's be faithful in our giving. And let's pray to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for uh, this opportunity, Lord, to give. And it is an opportunity. Lord, you've blessed us already uh, with financial blessings. And now, Lord, we want to return that to you. 
Uh, Lord, you've not asked us, Lord, you've not set the principle in your word to give it all back to you. We have to use some as, as wise stewards, Father, for groceries and our homes. But, Lord, you've asked us to give a little bit of that back to you, 10%. And Lord, help us to be faithful to that in whatever area of online or in the plate. Help us to be faithful to that. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for blessing so abundantly how you bless on the property, Lord. And we give you all the glory and praise and thanksgiving for everything. And Father, we ask you to continue to bless beyond measure in this place. And we'll thank you for all that you do. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I appreciate that. Take your Bibles this morning, please, and turn with us to the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew, chapter number 27, this morning in your Bible. And we're going to be reading just one verse and, and then looking at a lot of verses throughout the message this morning. So just reading one verse to begin with and then looking at many verses throughout the Word of God this morning. Again, thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord this morning, and I appreciate you so very much. My wife and I have had one of the busiest weeks we've ever had in our entire life this week, and uh, with a lot of family activities and other things. My sister-in-law just got married yesterday, and we're grateful for that, so you pray for uh, them. And uh, we also have been able to visit a couple of our families and our church that have had recent uh, children, little babies, for the first time. And, um, and we're grateful for them and looking forward to them getting back in church with us sometime very soon. And it takes some time to adjust, especially that first one. And, uh, but we're grateful that they're doing so great. And a little boy, got to visit a little boy on uh, Harris, uh, Harrison Holly on Friday or Thursday. What day was it? I can't remember. I, figured, I get them all run together one day and then got to visit a little girl, um, Cameron. Uh, Mayberry on uh, Friday. We're grateful for these wonderful, precious families. Matthew chapter 27, and look with me please in verse number 26. When you found your place, would you say amen? amen. That was a little bit weak. I feel like the hour time change from last Sunday is dragging on now into this Sunday, and I sure hope not. Let's try that one more time. And even if you don't even have a Bible, I want to encourage you to say amen. Uh, for the sake of your pastor and helping us realize there's a connection that you are alive this morning. So if you have found your place or if you are alive, would you say amen? amen. Thank you. That I feel revival ushering in right now in our hearts. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 26. The Bible said, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, I want you to, if you brought your Bible, if you didn't bring your Bible, that's fine. I want you to listen carefully. If you did bring your Bible, I want you to, I want you to keep it open because we're going to be looking at it a lot. This morning uh, is probably not going to be a lot of jokes and 
a lot of uh, laughter. I know sometimes we incorporate that into messages, and I like to laugh. The Bible teaches us, merry heart doeth good like a medicine. This morning is going to be more of a sober type of thought. As we begin thinking about Easter, or better, uh, perhaps to be mentioned as Resurrection Sunday, I want us to begin preparing our hearts for Resurrection Sunday. And so I believe this is what God has laid upon my heart as I prayed and sought Him about it. And so in this series, it's not really a series, but this morning you're going to be looking at the cross of Christ. Next Sunday morning, we'll be looking at the tomb of Christ. And then uh, next Sunday, after that, of course, we'll talk about the resurrection of Christ. And then after that, the ascension of Christ. So just a four-part message, really, is what it is. And, uh, and so we look forward to this. And I want you to pray that God would use it, the Lord would help me this morning. Uh, just a few things uh, right before we have our uh, song. I forgot to mention this. Our Young Adult Fellowship uh, activity will be meeting. Uh, Young Adult Fellowship activity uh, will be on the 23rd this Saturday. And we'll have a meeting really quickly after the service uh, by the organ over here. If you are part of that, we're going to be discussing where to go eat after that activity. And then also a care team meeting after the service this evening. And then also one of our young men that just surrendered to preach will be preaching uh, this evening. We're so excited about Jalen preaching for us. And you don't want to miss the service at 6 o'clock and come and support Jalen. He's a young man, young married man, young father. We're excited how God has called him. And we believe in the biblical uh, principle that God does call uh, men to preach the word of God. It's not just, uh, I think this is what I want to do. And, uh, but we're grateful for he and his family. Looking forward to him and preaching for us tonight. But again, the cross of Christ this morning. And let's pray, and then we'll have a song, and we'll get right into this thought this morning on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Father, for what it means to each one of us. Lord, I pray that you would use me this morning. Lord, I pray that you would give me clarity of mind. Lord, that you would use me to be a blessing. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, I, I don't want to just show up to this place. I love being here. I'm here about every day of my life. I love this place. I love the people that make it up, their sweet spirit, their faithfulness, their genuineness, their heart for you. I love just being around it. But, Lord, I just don't want to show up for just a meeting. Lord, I, I want you to work in our hearts mightily. Lord, even online, I pray, I know it's not the same, but I pray even online that you would be a blessing to those watching today that's not able to be with us. And Lord, I pray that you'd minister our hearts. I pray that most importantly, Lord, that if there's someone that does not know Jesus as their Savior, that they would trust Christ as their Savior this morning. Lord, that they would not leave this campus today without getting that assurance of knowing they're going to heaven if they were to have to leave this world. And Lord, I pray that you would draw us, every one of us, closer to you. Prepare our hearts for Easter, Lord, in a mighty way. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
I know I'll find him just the same If you've gone out on a limb For your way it may seem dim Don't give up and don't give in Casting all your care upon him Casting all your care upon him So much appreciate that this morning and I'm thankful that we can cast all our care upon the Lord and I hope and trust that you do that on a regular basis. Once again as we near Easter or Resurrection Sunday I would like for us to be reminded of several events surrounding the life of Christ and for the next few weeks we're going to be looking at as I already mentioned today the cross of Christ and then the tomb of Christ and the resurrection of Christ for Easter Sunday, and then the ascension of Christ as he went back to heaven after some days. We picked up our reading this morning in Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 26, right as the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, is allowing Jesus to be crucified. Now there are several things regarding this that are very important to remember. First thing, Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. It's a very good read, and I encourage you before Easter to maybe begin reading some of the the gospel story of the crucifixion of Jesus and uh, write the events that happened right before that. We're not going to go into detail about all of that. Maybe we will, maybe on a Wednesday night or something like that before Easter, uh, as we have been the last year or two. But tonight we're focusing on the cross. But I think it's important to understand concerning the cross that, again, Pilate, the Roman governor, uh, who Rome, of course, was the world power and overseeing Israel at that time, uh, did not want to crucify Jesus because Pilate said specifically, the judge, if you will, said, I find no fault at all in him. I find no fault at all in him. You see, the Jewish people... Uh, hated Jesus so much, the unbelieving Jewish people, hated Christ with such passion that they did not want to stone him, uh, which would be the death punishment according to the Jewish law. They wanted to see him suffer for a lengthy period of time. And what better way to do that than the Roman government's way of persecution, which was the cross, which was crucifixion. And so they hated him and despised him so very much, they brought him like a mob, if you will, to Pilate and said, we have found this man, according to our law, guilty. What was he guilty of? Well, he said he was God, manifest of the flesh. He did the miracles to prove that he was. They simply did not believe. And so they brought, brought Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate said, why do you want me to crucify him? He has done nothing wrong. I, I, he's not saying anything, and I cannot find any fault in him. Yet they continued to shout, and uh, the uh, Pilate eventually give in to them simply to satisfy the people. Again, crucifixions when, crucifixion was not a Jewish form of execution, but Romans. The thieves, raise your hand if you saw a, uh, uh, maybe a sign or a picture, or maybe three crosses out in a field somewhere representing Jesus. Raise your hand if you saw the three crosses instead of one. And of course, there was thieves that were crucified along with Jesus, one on each side of him, and of course, uh, giving reference to the fact that the crucifixion was a Roman form of punishment. Yet it was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament that Jesus was one day going to be crucified and he was going to do so for our sins. And so what we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the crucifixion of Christ is a fulfillment of prophecy hundreds of years prior uh, talking about the death of Christ. And this was a way that Jesus could shed his blood for our sins. The Bible teaches us it's through the shedding of blood that we're forgiven for our sins. 
So Jesus was not speared. He was not, of course, he was, after he died on the cross, he gave up the ghost. They uh, put a, a spear through his side. But he was not speared to death. He was not stoned to death. He shed his blood on the cross for our sins as a picture and type of fulfillment of the lambs that were shed in the Old Testament uh, for the forgiveness of sins. That is how God has set it up. There had to be a sacrifice for the forgiving of sins. The lambs... Uh, the literal lambs in the Old Testament was all a picture of what would one day happen about 2,000 year, 2, years ago on a hill we know as Calvary. And so I want us to look at several things about the cross this morning and how it, what it involved for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we read, this is very important. And again, no, no, not a lot of jokes this morning, more of a serious matter. So... When we meditate, when we read the crucifixion and what Jesus went through, what it will do if we really allow it to work in our heart and our mind, it will draw us closer to Jesus if you're saved. If you're not saved, it will draw you to him for salvation, realizing what he went through for your sins. So let's look at that this morning. Notice the first thing, if you're taking notes, and I know some do, some don't, but I want you to notice the first thing this morning, and that is the cross involved humiliation. Now, I want you to look with me in verse number 27 and verse number 28. Now, we did not read all of these verses to begin with a while ago because for sake of time, we're doing it in the message. So a little bit different format this morning, but I, but I believe with all my heart, this is what God would have me to uh, talk about this morning. Look at verse number 27, verse number 28. The Bible says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Verse 28, I want you to give special recognition and listening very carefully if you don't have your Bibles. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Now we'll get to the scarlet robe in just a moment, but I want to focus on verse 28 where the Roman soldiers stripped him. Throughout the few moments of the message this morning, I, I, want to, I don't have a lot of sub-points. I just want I just want I just want I just want us to soak it up. And I want us to be kind of it really helps me if I'm reading the Bible or listening to someone to preach, kind of put myself right on the sidelines of what's happening. You know, when David killed Goliath, I like to picture him going down to the brook, the little stream, picking out five smooth little pebbles, and going up to Goliath and his leather strap, his sling hanging from his side and and pulling that out, and Goliath, and you know, just looking at Goliath, and what a massive man he was. I bet his, you know, he probably wasn't very clean. I bet he was just a nasty, big old. I bet his breath stunk like something terrible. And just, I like to picture all of these things as I'm, I'm putting myself in the picture. And I want you to do that for with Jesus this morning. And I want you to put yourself right at Calvary. And I want you to put yourself, your eyes right upon Jesus. And I want you to picture the cross. I want you to picture the wooden beams that were put together uh, for the purpose of Christ. I want you to picture the nails that have went through his hands, literally. And I want you to picture that. I want you to picture uh, as he's walking up Golgotha Hill. I want you to picture and put yourself there. And this first point that we're looking at in verse 28, as Pilate has just said, look, I don't want him to be crucified because he's guilty of nothing that I can find, but fine. Since you want to do it, Jewish people, that's fine. It's nothing to me. And so I wash my hands of this man. I'm innocent, although that he wasn't. But I'm innocent of this. Go on and do whatever you need to do. Roman soldiers take him on to... We got two thieves lined up already. Take this man who they call the king of the Jews. Go, you take him along with those two thieves. And so they took him. And before the cross was a couple of different situations that Jesus went through... The first one was there was a humiliation that took place. These Roman soldiers would care nothing for Jesus. They would care nothing for Christianity. These guys were rough uh, sinners. I mean, just, just, a, just the roughest kind of form of 
uh, policing or, or soldiers you could, you could have. You didn't have all the, the different um, regulations and laws in our day that we have in America specifically that you would in their, that day in the Roman government 2,000 years ago. These soldiers basically did what they want. And they took Jesus into this area that they called this hall and they stripped him from his clothes right before they began to beat him. And we'll talk about that next. But I want us to think about the humiliation aspect of that, of Jesus as man being stripped from his clothing in a form of humiliation. No human being likes to be brought to humiliation. It is one thing to humble yourself. It is quite another to be humiliated. It is a biblical thing for a child of God to humble ourselves and to say, God, it is not in me. I need you. I need your grace. I need your strength. I need your help. I need to be saved because I can't do it in my own ability. It is one thing to humble ourselves, to bow before God and get on our knees, maybe in a worship service or in response to the message from the word of God that we've heard and say, God, I honor you and there's nothing good within me. It is all about you and humbling ourselves. It is one thing to humble yourself to have a good marriage and to, to swallow the pride between the marriage, the husband and the wife, and say, sweetie, I, I thought I was right, maybe I'm not, and to, to get along. It's one thing to humble yourself, but it's quite another to be humiliated in front of other soldiers as they laugh and they mock him and they sneer him. Yes, he's God manifest in the flesh, but he's man as well. Jesus, I'm reminded, has he wept when his friend Lazarus died. He was God, yet he was man as well. I'm reminded that he was God enough to, he could speak to the waves of the ocean and say, peace, be still. But he was still man and that he got tired and he slept in that boat. And so we're talking about a man here, the God-man, but in his man form being humiliated with his clothes, being stripped from him in this wicked wicked pre-Calvary situation. And I want us to remember that Jesus humbled himself to the cross for our sins. He knew what it would cost him as God. He knew this would happen. Yet he went through it for you and for me. We're prepping our hearts for Easter. And I want you to meditate on what Jesus as God knew. Because God is all-knowing, is he not? And so God knew this was going to happen, yet he did this for you. So first we see this humiliation, but then I want you to notice, secondly, the cross not only involved humiliation, the cross involved mockery. Look in verse number 28. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Verse 29 says, and when they had planted a crown of thorns, in other words, they went out... And they got, because he is the king of Jews, they didn't do this to probably other people, but because they said Jesus is the king of the Jews, which he is king of kings and lord of lords, they went out and found some briars, thick, large thorns, wrapped them together in a crowny thorn and pushed it, I believe they pushed it upon his brow. I believe that blood came out because of the thorns piercing into his brow. I'm not trying to, uh, to try to, uh, if there's any children in the audience, I'm not trying to uh, tr scare them, but I'm trying to be realistic about what is happening. I don't care what you saw in a video. I don't care what you read in a magazine. I don't care about the picture. I, I just want you to picture yourself what's happening here. They pushed this thorn upon him in a mocking state. They played of corn, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Explanation mark. So you can see this band of soldiers, and they're, they're putting a, a crown upon him. They put a, ruler, a scarlet robe around him. They've given him like a scepter or a, 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 a reed that a king would have in that day. And they bow before him, mocking him, laughing him. I can see maybe three or four of them getting around and bowing the knee before Jesus. And others laughing uncontrollably right behind them, mocking him. No individual likes to be mocked. 
No individual, you say, well, pastor, it really doesn't bother me. No, it does. If you have any pride at all, and everybody does, because we're human. Nobody likes to be mocked. Nobody likes to be made fun of. It is one of the most degrading things that you can do as an individual, yet Jesus allowed himself and knew what he was going to go through for you and I. So not only pre-Calvary, pre-cross, not only was he humiliated, stripped from his garments, but now he is being mocked as the king of the Jews. Notice the third thing, the cross involved abuse. Verse number 30, look at it with me. And they what? They spit upon him. Now this is the next time they spit upon him, but I want you to notice very closely they spit upon him and took the reed. They took it out of his hand and then they smote him on the head with it. Now I assure you that they did not take this and just bump him on the head. He's getting ready to what? He's getting ready to die. They could care less. And matter of fact, historians tell us that a lot of people that were crucified, as they would go through this scourging, they would go through this whipping, we'll get to it in just a minute, as they were going through these pre-crucifixion uh, elements and these actions, they would die before they ever got to the cross. These Roman soldiers could care less. Jesus to these Roman soldiers is just another prisoner. All they have been given is what they, he says he is, but that their command of their governor says, we're going to do whatever we want with it. And so he's being abused. And not only would these actions be physical abuse, but also mental and emotional abuse. I'm reminded here before we move on to the fourth thing that Jesus can associate with everything that you go through. Let's stop here for just a minute for just some practical Christianity. I'm thankful the Bible teaches us we have a great high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. In other words, when you go through the emotional trial, and don't look at me like that, I know every one of us do. When you go through the physical trial, when you go through the mental trial, when you go through the depression, when you go through the anxiety, when you go through being hurt, when you go through being physical hurt, whatever. Now, if you get physical hurt, you need to seek some help by that, right? But if you're going through any situation, understand that at this little short time frame, not to mention the rest of his 33 and a half years that he grew up in a, in a world, but just this little short time, all that he's experiencing. I'm grateful that I have somebody that I can call to that has been not only where I have been, but much to a greater degree. And I can call out to him and say, Lord... Sometimes we have this idea, nobody understands and Jesus can say, I do. I've been there. Aren't you thankful for that? Notice the fourth thing, the cross involved criticism. Now we're going to read from verse 35 down through verse 44. Follow along with me. Don't fall asleep, please. Verse number 35. It's really quiet this morning. I get nervous when it gets quiet. I usually preach a lot longer when it gets quiet. I guess that's okay. And uh, I was looking for an amen. And uh, okay, there, there's one back there. Smart aleck. Verse number 35. Look at it with me. Verse number 35. No, I'm just kidding. I love you guys. I don't know who that was, but I love you. Verse number 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And there's a lot of prophecy, many prophecies that was fulfilled the day of crucifixion. Verse number 36, And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head an accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and they, paw, and they passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads. Notice what they said. All of these people, this was a public punishment to let everybody else know that Rome means business. You don't steal and get by with it. You don't do this and get by with it. If you steal, you're going to be on this cross. This was a public 
crucifixion. And so all of these people are walking by. Notice what they said in verse 40, that thou destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. They did not understand all the prophecy that needed to be fulfilled because Jesus was doing that for them. Verse number 41, by the way, he could have came down. He's God. But aren't you thankful he didn't? We would have no need to be here at all if Jesus came down from the cross. Why would we be here? Look at verse, verse 41. Likewise, all the chief priests mocking him. These are the religious leaders mocking him. And when the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Aren't you thankful? One of those thieves throughout the period of the crucifixion understood, wait a minute. You know what? This man is the son of God. And he called upon Jesus for salvation. But at first they were reviling him and criticizing him. And we go through that ourselves, don't we? People say to us, oh, well, if you're a Christian and you're going through that heartache, you're going through that trial, why don't you just pray to God? Well, if, you, if your God can do the impossible, why don't you just ask him? You, you talk about praying and how important it is. Why don't you just pray and ask him? He, he ought to be doing, doing that right now. If there really is a God in heaven, well, he ought to answer your prayer just like that if he's your child. If he really loved you, would he really let you go through that? If he really cared for you, would he really allow you to go through this situation that you're going through? And that is what the outside world is going to say. But aren't you thankful, again, that we have a God in heaven that has went through this as well? The criticism. And I just want to encourage you as children of God in 2024 as we try to biblically and godly live for Christ in this crazy upside down world. Just keep on keeping on for the cause of Christ. Amen. Notice the next thing. Number five. The cross involved, and I'm almost done. The cross involved pain. Now look at verse number 35 and I think that is kind of obvious here. In verse number 35, and they crucified him. Can we say that out loud together? Ready, begin. And they crucified him. One more time, that was good. Listen very carefully, say it with me. Ready, begin. And they crucified him. Crucifixion involved pain. And I know that is common sense, I, I, but I, I, I have this idea that sometimes we think that, well, he had a little pedestal to stand upon or he had, he was, he had ropes there and so forth. No, uh, I, he was nailed to the cross. The Bible teaches us uh, that he was nailed to the cross and, and uh, he had these, it wasn't just carpenter nails that we would use to put up a two by four. These are nails that were for the specific purpose of nailing somebody for the punishment of what they're wrongdoing and being crucified, nailed to the cross. I can picture that. I can picture that at Calvary. They've got the wooden beam laying there. Jesus, the Bible says, humbled himself to the death of the cross so they did not have to force him at spear point and say, get on that cross. He laid down his life for you us. He knew that's what he came to do. He prayed in the garden not too long before this, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And he laid down on the cross and they began nailing his right hand to the cross, to the right beam of that, with a large hammer going right through his body. And then willingly, can you imagine that pain? And then willingly now giving his left arm. Nailing that to the cross. Now his feet being nailed through with a nail to the cross. And thou setting that up. If that was not, as if that was not enough, taking it, I can see about six or seven, maybe eight of these 
Roman soldiers picking up the cross and setting it down in a hall. I do not believe that they did it gently. They're mocking him. They're putting a crown of thorns. I cannot picture them setting that down in a hole. I don't know if you've ever put a four by four post in a, a deep, you know, three or four foot deep hole, whatever deep depth it was. Uh, but putting that in there, it kind of like jolts down in there, kind of bounces just a little bit on that dirt down the bottom. And I can picture that being some depth to that picture that jolt, the nails in his, his hand, his feet. And yet he did that for you. He did that for me. The cross would involve the nails. And then this is what I want us to notice in verse 26 once again. Not only would the cross involve the, the nails, speaking of the pain, but the cross would involve the pain of the scourging. Look again at verse number 26. Then released Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. What does that mean, scourge? It, it is referring to the flogging. It is referring to the whipping. So before the cross, these thieves probably had it done to them as well. So when a person got to the cross, they would be whipped before the cross. They would have, uh, the Roman soldiers would have a uh, leather strap and it had would have uh, like a leather handle and it would have multiple leather uh, strings uh, like a, the size of a belt or so uh, coming off of that and at the ends of these uh, pieces of leather strap would have pieces of uh, bone rock glass other sharp uh, pieces that would obviously be a form of punishment upon the wrongdoer Jesus gets scourged just like anybody else we find that when he's on the cross, the Old Testament, if it prophesied about him being crucified, then the other prophecies must be true as well, right? And they said that his visage, in other words, how he appeared, you couldn't even tell he was a man. In other words, he was so bloody, he was so beat up, I could picture chunks of his flesh being taken out. I'm not trying to be overdoing it, I'm just trying to be very realistic this morning. Because he did that for you. Can I remind you this morning that without the cross, there would be no resurrection. And I wanted to remind us what Jesus went through this morning. And if that does not do something in your heart, I do not have anything in my toolbox that will. I do not have any illustration better than the preaching of the cross. I do not have any better tone of voice. I do not have a, a, a suit that will try to get your attention. I do not have any gimmicks that will try to get your attention. The preaching of the cross, it is what calls people and draws people to the Savior. And I want you to notice the last thing this morning, and I'm done. The cross involves separation. Now, I believe that this was the worst part of the cross for Christ. And I want, to give you, I want to bring your attention to verse number 45 and verse 46. Verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land under the ninth hour. Isn't that interesting? It's just God doing all of these things. Verse number 46, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, and that is the, to say, in other words, here's the interpretation, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is interesting, because we learn in the word of God that God will never leave us nor forsake us. Aren't you thankful for that promise? And I believe that promise for the child of God. Well, what happens is sin separates Go back with me for just a moment to the beginning of creation when God created the birds and the animals and the oceans. We talked about last Sunday morning, all that's his. But go back with me in Genesis where God created man. Male and female created them. God created Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve were with God, a holy, righteous, perfect God. Adam and Eve were perfect. They did no wrong. They were unclothed. They had no shame whatsoever of being out in public unclothed. They, they, they were innocent. There was no sin. God had one rule. He says, don't eat of that tree right there. It's called the knowledge of tr tr tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that fruit. We don't know what it was. A lot of people say it's apple. And I, I guess it's a, a good 
would be a good thing, you know, to be an apple. But it could have been a pear. could have been an orange. We don't know. But it was some type of fruit. And God just said, listen, you can do whatever you want, but just don't eat that tree, the fruit. And Eve did and gave to Adam, and Adam ate, and they disobeyed God. And from that moment on, they were separated from not only God, but the Garden of Eden, that perfect place where it's so perfect and holy and just a wonderful place. They were separated from that from a three-letter word, sin. Sin. They chose to sin. And that is why you and I cannot get to God either. That is why without Jesus and apart from salvation, we cannot get to God to a place called heaven. We cannot even have a personal relationship with God because of that word called sin. And don't tell me I'm not a sinner. I've had people tell me, well, I'm not, you know, I'm, you know and I'm thinking to myself, you're telling me you're perfect. People tell me, I'm not a sinner. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you are. <laughs> you know, I am, you are, everybody is a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned come short of the glory of God. We don't, we don't like the feeling of guilt is what it is. And we have pride. <clears throat> it goes back to pride. And we think to ourselves, well, I don't want to. I haven't done wrong. We think about be, doing something like murder or something like that. And uh, we think, man, I haven't done anything to be wrong. I'm not really in the wrong. I'm not a sinner. But if you've disobeyed like Adam and Eve, then you're a sinner. Just one time. You don't have to have your, your fingerprints down at the police department to be a sinner. I knew I was a sinner as a six-year-old boy that went to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Because I would disobey my parents. I know I, we, we're all sinners if we'll just be honest with ourselves. And sin separates man from God. On the cross, the Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. So what happened on the cross? This is why Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because at that point... When he was suspended between God and man, heaven and earth, God put all of your sin and mine upon Jesus. And so God had to turn his face away from his son. Because all of that sin was shouldered upon him. You see, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. You see, you just can't get by with things. Our society understands that. If you do something wrong, you've got to get punished for it. It comes from the word of God. God says the wages of sin is death. If you do wrong, you've got to be punished for it. Jesus died in your place on the cross. He took your sin upon himself. Now we'll get to the resurrection soon. But I want you to think about what Jesus has done for you. Because of through, the res through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he has made it you be able to have access to God. Because God says... If you acknowledge that Jesus took your sin upon him and you'll call out to me for salvation, I will, put, I will recognize your sin upon Jesus and I will forgive you for your sin. It's almost like if you went in the courtroom and the judge says, you're guilty and you said, I know it. You've got a hundred years life sentence in prison and you said, man. And they were getting ready to take you back to the prison to serve your 100 year sentence and somebody walked in the back of the courtroom and they said, look, I know him. And you said, I don't know you. But they looked at you and said, I know you. And I love you. And you looked at him like he was crazy. But he, and he said to the judge, Judge, if you allow me to, I know it sounds a little, you know, a little funny, but I would like to take his place, his punishment, his crime upon myself. And the judge would look at him and look at you and he says, Well, sir, if that's okay with you, and we would look at him and look at the judge and think to ourselves, are you kidding? How good could this be? Sure. And so the judge hammers that on the desk and he says, you're taking the punishment for you. And so you go scot-free. That man that you didn't even know took your place. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. You didn't even know him. We weren't looking for him. But he loved you and he took your place. And all you have to do is acknowledge that, accept him as your personal Savior. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe what you've done for me. You took my sin upon yourself. I want you to come into my heart and save me. At that moment, God says, I recognize what Jesus did for you, and I accept that repentance, and I, uh, Jesus will save you, forgive you for being, your, uh, for being a sinner. 
It's funny because people look at that and they think it couldn't be that simple. And so people began going to church to say, I'm going to try to improve myself. And people say, I'm going to put something in the offering plate so I can improve myself. And people say, I'm going to start doing this and stop doing this so I can improve myself. And God said, no, it's not about that. It's not by works. If you could get there by not doing something or doing something, implementing something in your life, then what would the cross be for? But it's all about the cross. You say, I'm going to straighten out my life a little bit and then I'll get saved. Then I'll get in church. No, God takes care of that when you call upon him for salvation. You just got to admit you're a sinner and admit Jesus has already took your punishment. Would you do that this morning? If you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior. You say, I believed all my life. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about realizing you're a sinner Realizing what Jesus has done for you and calling out to him and saying, Lord, I need to be saved from, my, from being a sinner. I want to go to heaven. And I believe what you've done for me and I accept that. We would love to take the Bible one-on-one, show you how you can know for sure. Show what the Bible says. If you have any questions to help you with that, we want to help you with that. Let's stand our, our feet with our heads bowed and eyes are closed very quietly. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. Lord, I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you for Calvary. I thank you for shedding your blood for my sins. I thank you for working in my heart one day when I was just a small boy, but I realized I was a sinner and I realized there's a punishment. I realized I needed to be saved. And I thank you for working in my heart. Lord, I pray that you work in others' hearts this morning about their need of Christ as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you would help it to work in our hearts, those of us who are saved, about our service for you, our need of getting closer to you in our fellowship with whatever that may be in our lives. As our instrumentalists begin playing very softly, I want to ask you this question. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I know for sure that I am saved, that I've called upon Jesus for salvation, and I'm thankful and I'm not ashamed of that. Would you raise your hand this morning? I appreciate that. I appreciate the honesty. I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I know for sure in my heart I'm not saved. And I need to call upon Jesus for salvation. I'm just, I've just never made that decision, but I know I need to. I would love to pray for you in my private time with God that you would make that decision. Would you raise your hand this morning and say, Pastor, pray for me that I would make that decision. Anybody like that this morning, would you raise your hand, hold it there for just a minute. Pray for me, Pastor, that I would make that decision in my life. If you're here this morning and you're a child of God, when is the last time that you thank Jesus for dying for you? When's the last time that you thank Jesus for shedding his blood for you? When is the last time that you thanked him for all that he went through, knowing what he would go through for you? When's the last time that you thanked him sincerely? You took the time to do so. If you have never done that, or maybe you're a little bit past due, as my pastor would say, I wonder if you would find your place on the altar this morning and just want to thank God. You don't want to thank Him for food, clothes, church, nothing. You just simply want to come and say thank you for Jesus for dying for my sins. Would you come right now? Brother Holly is going to play, sing for us. And as he sings, I want to encourage you to slip out of your pew and just come around the altar and say, Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. Would you come? Step out of your pew. How about it? I'm not trying to get you to come. But I, I do want to encourage you if the Holy Spirit of God is nudging your heart to do so, to come. A thankfulness for the cross will do wonders for a church. A gratitude for Christ, what he's done, will transform your life from the inside out. It will cause you to serve. It will cause you to be faithful, to be motivating. Charge of God, I come. You're singing another verse. Would you come this morning? Think about the words. Just as I am and waiting God to rid my soul. Sing the next verse together.
together while folks are praying. I want you to give it all you've got. Think about the words. Let's sing together. Here we go. Just as sing now. I am. service, our motive for Christian living in every way. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for being here. You can be seated. We're going to finish the service with our minute and a half video announcements and we'll be dismissed. I do want to say that if you're here and you have a need in your life, uh, whatever that may be, if you want to see myself or my wife, youth pastor, his wife after the service, We'll help you in any way that we can. We're usually the last people to leave. If you'll wait just a moment, we'd love to help you with anything that we can. All right? We're grateful for you. We love you. We're thankful that you're here this morning. Listen to these announcements. We've got a lot of things happening. And I want you to listen carefully, and then we'll be dismissed. All right, Mike, let's make that adjustment there, and uh, I think there's uh, a button we need to press. We're getting closer. 23rd. If you are between the ages of 19 and 49, make plans now to join us for this fun time of fellowship and encouragement. If you plan to attend, please see the sign-up sheet today located in the entry. We will also have a brief meeting for those who are planning to attend immediately following our service this morning near the organ. We are very excited about our annual Easter Spectacular on Saturday, March 30th from 11 to 1. This is a free and on-campus event for both our church and community. Join us for hot dogs and concessions, inflatables, face painting, as well as a large Easter egg hunt beginning at 12 p.m. For those in our church who would like to help with this event, candy for the Easter egg hunt is still much needed. You can drop off candy in the bin provided near the media desk. Volunteers are also needed after next week's Sunday evening service for egg and candy assembly. We are very excited about our Easter services this year on Sunday, March 31st. Make plans now and begin inviting others to be with us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. You may choose to join us for our early service at 8.30 a.m. for special Easter music and sermon, or for our regular 11 a.m. service and ministries, our children's and adult Bible classes at 10 a.m., and our evening service at 6 p.m. are also on regular schedule. Let's pray together for God's many blessings on this special weekend. Our next Empty Nesters Fellowship will be an activity on Saturday, April 13th. If you are between the ages of 50 and 65 and would like to be a part of this event, please see the sign-up sheet and other information today located in the entryway. For any questions, please see Jeff or Nancy Coss. Thank you once again for joining us this morning. We hope each family can join us again this evening at 6 p.m. for more uplifting singing as well as another helpful Bible message that will strengthen us spiritually together once again. Thank you again so much for being here. Young Adult Fellowship, uh, don't forget, if you haven't signed up, that's okay. You can still uh, come over here and meet with us really briefly, and we'll let everyone get out before we have that meeting. Keep all the other sign-up sheets in mind, please. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, don't forget about choir practice at 5 o'clock, service tonight, 6 o'clock. If you're glad you came, would you say amen? amen. Let's be back in our place, 6 o'clock. God bless you. You're dismissed. Turn around and shake a visitor's hand this morning. Thank you.